CPI is at 5.4% uh, in June, core is at 4.5%. Uh, and it almost feels like everything we're hearing from executives, especially in like the food sector, uh, is just, hey, our inputs are going up, we're increasing prices, we're not gonna stop, we're gonna keep doing that. Customers seem to be responsive to that. Uh, it's almost like they're getting like a positive feedback loop and, and it's gonna encourage them to do it more. At the same time, we're hearing from politicians, uh, you know, either one, this is transitory, it's gonna go down, uh, stop worrying about it, it's not that big of a deal. Or two, oh, yes, it's higher than we expected, but we're just gonna spend more, whether it's infrastructure or otherwise to, to kind of get out of it. Without thinking about like what to do as an investor, just your evaluation of inflation today, who's right? Is, are both people kind of sort of right in each group? How do you feel uh, about where we are today? Do we go up from here? Do, does it kind of go sideways? And is there a difference between the rate of change versus the actual aggregate change of prices um, and kind of the belief that like that'll stay constant in the future? Yeah, you really nailed it at the end there, I think. There's a difference between the rate of change and the absolute price level, and that's what trips people up about transitory. So generally, you know, uh, but you know, among the macro analysts, I've been in the inflationary camp for the past few years. Uh, and so we're seeing this play out. Uh, but I think the way to think about it is to make sure you understand the difference between rate of change inflation and absolute inflation. So rate of change inflation would be, you know, prices are say 5% higher than a year ago. Now, if next year prices are only 4% or 3% higher than, than now, that's, that's, you know, less inflation rate of change terms, uh, but it's not like those prices went back down. There was no deflation that took those prices away. So you can have, you can have niche areas that say go back down, like lumber was a very specific bottleneck. Whereas once Chipotle raises prices and wages, we're, you're never going to see the old prices and wages again. That That's a new level that we've reached in absolute terms. And so uh, again, the analogy I use is the 40s because, you know, everyone thinks of inflationary 70s, but in the 40s, which again was the last time we saw this sort of fiscal monetary environment, uh, similar kind of external catalyst that justified a lot of the fiscal spending that we saw. Uh, now, of course, there's the pandemic, there's the, you know, all sorts of other things that they can use as cover. And so what we're seeing essentially is, you know, in the 40s, you had, a, you had high inflation, it actually literally got 19% year over year at one point, then it would cool off and go back down to zero. Uh, but there's no period of deflation. It's not like it's not like those prices went down. They just stopped going up. They leveled off, and then they'd have another big spike to like 12%. Then they would level off. Then they would spike again by like 8%, level off. And so you had these stepwise increases in prices. And so my overall model for the 2020s is kind of like that, where I don't think we're just going to have like this big giant runaway inflation, but I think we're going to have these periods where prices go up pretty rapidly and then maybe cool off for a time, but we don't we don't deflate back down to where we were before. And so I think, you know, basically by the end of the decade, people holding cash and bonds will have been able to buy fewer goods and services with those with those things than they could before. And of course, there'll be some disinflationary areas due to technology, software, music, uh, maybe, you know, a clothes, attire, things you actually want, as Michael Saylor puts it, things that you actually key key real estate, key companies, uh, you know, uh, uh, gold or Bitcoin, like things that are actually scarce. Uh, that that aren't being just like made far more abundant due to technology. Those are the things that I, you know your your bonds and cash are likely to buy a lot fewer of those things five, 10 years from now. Yeah, the, the thing to me that is absolutely uh, scary and Stanley Druckenmiller had a, a, a pretty, I don't know, a week where he went pretty hard at this uh, across a couple of different uh, venues where he basically said, look, the devaluation of the dollar, the Federal Reserve's actions over the last decade or so coming out of the 08 crisis uh, has led to a massive increase in wealth inequality. Um, and it seems like you're in a similar camp where you're saying, look, uh, those that are just holding cash, you're going to lose all that purchasing power. The people who actually hold uh, what end up being kind of resilient uh, value accre uh, accretive assets, those are the people who are going to get richer. And so is it fair? to kind of say that that wealth inequality gap based on where we're going today given the information we have that's only going to get wider and wider in the future it depends on the types of inflation we see and so over the past decade uh you know until until this like last year where we're actually getting some some real cpi inflation uh the past decade is mostly characterized by asset price inflation and not really cpi inflation uh so that was kind of a, a somewhat disinflationary tech heavy decade where if you were owning you know uh, key properties or key tech companies or just the S&P 500 as a whole, uh, you know, you, you got much further ahead than someone who was not in, invested in assets. Uh, and so if we start to see that shift towards more commodity inflation, uh, and we start to see that shift towards wages and reshoring uh, and those sorts of things uh, trickling through the system, I, I do think the 2020s could be a different type of decade where wealth concentration stays flat or maybe even goes down a little bit because it's a different type of inflation than what we saw last decade. Uh, and so, you know, it's one of those things where at cash and bondholders are getting inflated away. But at the same time, a lot of people uh, have debts uh, and debts are the other side of that equation. So if someone has 
say, assets that are, say, a house and you have a 30 year mortgage, uh, if we do have a somewhat inflationary decade, that should, uh, say, be good for that, you know, kind of conservatively leveraged homeowner. Uh, and so I do think you could have that type of environment. Uh, so it really kind of comes down to what types of inflation we get. Is it is it wage uh, and and kind of commodity inflation, or is it more that that same sort of of asset price inflation? When you think about uh, a portfolio, uh, inflation hedge ends up being a very popular uh, kind of term that people are are thinking about or, or actually acting on. Um, I believe that you own Bitcoin and gold. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. And then. What, how do you think about sizing inflation hedge type assets in a portfolio? Are there other assets that you're looking at from an inflation hedge perspective? And then also maybe any comments in terms of it seems like the stock market has become an inflation hedge to some degree and, and people are kind of piling in there as well. Um, and so kind of how do you just think about what to do once you understand the inflation uh, situation we're in? Yeah, I mean, so the major inflation hedges are gold. Gold's kind of a weird one because it can do well in inflation or disinflation. What gold primarily is, is a hedge against negative real yields. Uh, and so that can actually happen in, in disinflationary or inflationary environments where something like copper, oil, uh, you know, uh, those types of industrial commodities are more inflation hedges. Uh, and so even if even if real rates are positive, if, if inflation's high, those things are likely doing well, in part because they're often what's what's driving the inflation. Uh, and so and, and Bitcoin is own beast. I mean, obviously, the, the past 10 years, the last decade was mostly inflationary for asset prices, not not, say, the commodity index. Uh, and Bitcoin obviously was was tremendously successful uh, because it's I've described it as kind of co combining gold with the tech stock. Uh, so you have that digital scarcity gold 2.0 narrative combined with the fact that, you know, say, unlike gold, which is going to be the same 10 years from now uh, in terms of what it is, uh, the Bitcoin network is better now than it was five years ago. And unless there's some sort of catastrophic tail risk, it'll most likely be better five years from now. So the, there'll be more activity on the Lightning Network. Basically, there's developers every single day working on making Bitcoin better. Uh, kind of like if you own, say, tech stock, let's say Roku, for example, there's there's people working every day to build that network out. And so I, I, I kind of view it like that. So again, Bitcoin is not a pure inflation hedge. It's more of a, a it's a gold 2.0, so a hedge against uh, fiat debasement while also kind of a, a growth stock in its own rate. So it's actually taking market share. So I, I think generally, if you're going to hedge against inflation, you want to have some degree of commodity exposure, commodity companies, and then how you size that partially depends on what your conviction level is for inflation. Uh, and so my overall approach is to have some energy companies, some gold miners. Uh, I, I did have copper miners, but I trimmed them out when they when they kind of went parabolic there. And then I, I you know I might add to add back to them. Uh, and so kind of, I have kind of that barbell approach where I have some, you know, long-term growth stocks that, that are, you know, I think basically disruptors, they're, they're, they have this long-term compounding effect. And then I, on the other side of the spectrum, that's when I have that more commodity exposure uh, or, or gold and, and then things like that. And then Bitcoin's kind of in the middle where it's, 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 it's both sides of the camp, essentially.